Have you all had a good conference? Yeah. It's been wonderful, hasn't it? It's really nice. I learned, so, so was it Florian you said a couple years ago? I've learned a lot this conference. And I've been working furiously to update this deck, but this is the nice part about going last, is I get to update it and add new things. Um, so I learned a ton. So I'm going to go fast in this. There's a lot of slides. There is a link at the end if you want the deck. So feel free to take pictures, but you can have everything. So just sit back, relax, and let's have fun. So I learned, like I said, a ton. And this is a great conference because, well, we've got a movie screen. And why not incorporate movie things into this? So we learned from a cat and a squirrel, which is fantastic, and a steward on top of that. And uh, I saw a great talk this morning from Miguel, who reminds me with his voice of Antonio Banderas. And then there was a, a, a researcher, a detective as well. So all of these people, I saw lots of other great talks as well, and I didn't have time to put them all in, and they didn't all directly reference. But every single one of these talks, Cat, Squirrel, Stuart, Anto uh, Miguel, not Antonio, and Janelle, all of their stuff is either directly referenced by me or they directly reference something that I'm going to talk about. So if you see something, please credit them. And uh, taking inspiration from Stuart, there is one movie reference in here. It's really subtle. If you find it, please shout out the name of the movie when you see it. I'll be really excited. Okay, let's get into it. So let's talk about tools. So uh, as Janelle was saying, we need to start with definitions. Definitions are really important because we talk past each other a lot. So what is a tool? Not gonna make you do pop quiz and stand up and do this yourself. A tool is something that helps you accomplish a task. It's pretty simple. Tasks are important. As people who work in product fields, we have a lot of them. And the tasks that we get are often really poorly defined. And that's if we're lucky. If we're unlucky, they're defined really, really well with no flexibility and we're told to JFDI, which I'm not sure it translates into Polish, it's just effing do it. Um, so that's not great. But still, we use a lot of tools. And why do we use them? Well, we use them because we believe in process. We want things to be safe and predictable. We want to have a confidence that when we do our job, that if we keep doing it, things are going to work. It doesn't always work that way, though. We have a lot of tools and frameworks and different ways that we approach things. We love our tools. Product people love tools like developers love languages. We always want to try the new sexy thing. And there's so many out there. And I love every single one of these, and I also despise every single one because they just don't work, except when they do. So let's go back to why we use tools. So all of these things, all of those tools on the previous page, they're, you know about them, you've used them because someone wrote about them, or someone talked about it, or someone did it on a podcast. And you saw it and you said, that, that might help me. And as someone who has written a book and has a podcast and blogs sometimes and is standing in front of you right now, I'm going to tell you that's complete and utter crap. We don't know what we're talking about. The tools that are out there worked for people in very specific circumstances. They worked probably in one time. And there's a huge survivorship bias or success bias that's included when people talk about the tools that work, but they don't talk about everything else that didn't. And they don't talk about when they use that tool and it didn't work. And that happens an awful, awful lot. So let's actually use a couple of the tools. Let's start with the five whys, but I don't have enough time to do all five, so we'll do a few. Uh, so why do we use tools? We use tools to deliver great products. That's what we're trying to do. Make sense? Yeah, good. But why do we need tools to do that? Well, we need the tools because we're having trouble. 
usually with process or alignment or stakeholders. Hoping that sounds familiar. You've probably experienced some of these problems. So why are we having these problems? Well, like Squirrel said yesterday, it's probably because we're not having the right conversations or at least not very productive ones. So let's talk about those conversations a little bit. Actually, before we get to conversations, let's talk about one, let's use another one of the tools. Let's use jobs to be done. So what is the job to be done for using tools as part of our product development process? Well, my friend Monica is much smarter than I am, uh, and she has a great line. She says that we help people to make better decisions faster. And that's really all we're trying to do. Some, getting it out the door isn't actually that hard. I mean, sometimes it's really bloody hard, but getting it out the door isn't the hard part. It's figuring out what do we get out the door and making sure that everyone is aligned and working well on that. That is much, much, much harder. So, and we've, Automate this. We've even applied tools to our own processes. You know, we now uh, there's all these articles and uh, blogs out there about how to use ChatGPT to become a better product manager. And this is the best thing I've ever read about ChatGPT and other large language models: mansplaining as a service. And I realize, as a white guy, middle-aged, standing here in front of you, and you can't interrupt me that I might be mansplaining myself. However, the idea that something that g instantly generates vaguely plausible sounding, yet totally fabricated and baseless lectures in an instant, this may be plausible, or at least plausible sounding. I can't tell you, wasn't instantly generated, it's not completely baseless, uh, but with unflagging confidence in its own correctness on any topic, yeah, this is a problem. We can't automate things. We can't trust things to automation completely. So going back to the job to be done, the job that we are trying to use tools for is to get products out the door, to get great products out the door. And that starts with conversations. And sometimes, you know, if you're the product person on the team, people look at you like you don't fit in. You're not just like them. And sometimes you're talking past each other. You're not speaking the same language. So one of the jobs that you have to do is to get everyone aligned, to get on the same page. You don't always have to agree, but you do have to be aligned. But to get other people aligned with you, sometimes you actually have to start with the conversation with yourself. You have to go for a bit of a walk and you have to figure out, is this what I'm thinking makes sense? Is what, uh, am I talking to other people in a way that's coherent? Does the logic all stack up? Is it defensible? Is it, is it useful? So we have to have that conversation with ourselves first. So if it's about conversations with others and ourselves, again, why do we really use tools? You've probably seen something like this before. You know the story. You want to hang a picture. Actually, you want to put a nail on the wall, right? But no, you don't want to put a nail on the wall. You want to hang a picture. And actually, you don't even want to hang a picture. You want to have art on your wall so that when somebody comes over, they're impressed by you. Or when you're sitting on the couch, the, the house looks nicer. The tool, the hammer, the nail, it's ephemeral. It's temporary. It's there to serve a purpose. And a hammer and a nail might not even be the right tool. There's other, plenty of other ways of hanging things up now. There's sticky things and Velcro things and all kinds of other stuff. So the tool isn't the point. It is a means to an end. And the tool at best gives you an answer. And you probably know this if you're a fan of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The answer to life, the universe, and everything is 42. The problem is, no one actually knows what the question is. And we need to make sure that we're asking the right questions. I did used to work with someone who worked with someone who worked with Douglas Adams, and they claimed, over many beers, to know what the question was. And they did tell me, and if you go out with me later, I may be tricked into telling you, but I can't promise that I'm right on that. And if you know the story, 
the way to generate the question was actually the planet Earth. The planet Earth was considered a supercomputer, and it was destroyed in the book minutes before it was going to give the actual question. So the tool in this case was Earth, which was destroyed. Anyway, moving on. Getting to the right question is really key. Doctors don't just write a prescription and tell you what to do to cure something without doing a diagnosis first. We do the same thing. We may not have the level of training that they do, the level of certification that they do, but we do a differential diagnosis ourselves. We just call it discovery. And this is what we do research for. We need to make sure before we write a prescription, before we decide a course of action, that everyone understands what the goal is, in this case health, and what the right way to, go there, to get there is. And to be honest, most of the time when doctors are writing prescriptions, it's an experiment as well. Let's try this and see what works, see if it works. And if it doesn't work, we'll try something else. But we know what the end result, we know what good looks like. So getting to the right questions is really important. I have a model I use. I call it a model because it's four things and they all start with the letter P and therefore it's officially a model, right? So the first one is people. Do we have the right people? Are they available to us? Do they have the right skill set? Um, do they have the right permissions and culture to do the job that they need to do? Let's make sure we have the right people in place. If you have good people, then the next thing is, do they have processes that work for them? And this is where the Scrum Masters and everyone else comes in, but it's not just about Scrum or about the Agile process. It's the entire organizational process. Do we have processes that add value, that allow us to get value to customers and to the company? Or do we have processes that simply create more bureaucracy, that are processes in service of more process? You know, there are people who want that. There are people who want the illusion of control over things. And it is, that is more important to them than shipping value out the door. And sometimes you do want process in regulated industries and for uh, critical things. But the key point of all processes, is this helping us deliver value faster? And anything that's stopping you from doing that has to be questioned. Is this the best way for us to be working? And good people and good processes only go so far if you're working on the wrong things. So people working with good processes on the things that are actually prioritized, the things that are most important to the company and more importantly to the customer. If you're doing all that, then you're in good shape. And for a long time, I thought it was just these three Ps. And I was re feeling really good about myself anytime I got these right. And then I realized why it wasn't always working. And it's because there's a fourth P, and that fourth P is perception. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what you think about how these three things are going. If everyone else on the team, if the other departments that you work with don't feel the same way. Everyone has to agree that the people are good enough, that the processes are doing the jobs that need to be done, and that you're working on the right stuff. And if not, you're not gonna get anywhere. This is the stuff Squirrel was talking about yesterday with the world's longest uh, scrum board. Amazing processes, potentially some great people, terrible prioritization and a perception by the board that there was no value being delivered and a perception from the team that they were doing great work. You have to have all these things aligned. So let's talk about how we actually use the tools. So I've been slagging off the tools for the last 20 minutes, telling you how terrible they are. And the, secret, the, the real truth is there's nothing wrong with the tools in and of themselves. It's how we use them. Because no matter how good a hammer is, if you keep doing this to yourself, it is not a good tool. So let's talk about some of the problems that keep cropping up in the way that people use tools. Well, we say that they don't work, except when they do. And we say they don't work for a very specific reason. It's again, because we want to believe in magic, 
We want a fantasy. We want the fantasy that if I have a problem and I apply a tool, magically I'm going to get a solution. And it just does not work that way. It doesn't work that way because one size does not fit all. The people who used a tool successfully were not you, especially if you're reading about it or hearing about it from them firsthand. They're not you. They don't have the same mix of personalities. They might be in a different business in a different sector with different conditions, different competition. They might have any number of different priors uh, involved. Just because it worked for them doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Uh, this came up earlier today. I think, uh, yeah, in Miguel's talk, the Spotify models. How many people have seen this or tried this in the past? Yeah. Spotify model is really famous. About 10 years ago, I think it was, it was all over the place and everyone was convinced our processes aren't working. Spotify is growing like crazy. This is what they do. Let's do that. Problem is, it doesn't work that way. Uh, last year, Paul, the organizer of the conference, or the, the uh, co-organizer of the conference, um, and I got a chance to spend three days in London with uh, Marty Kagan and the Silicon Valley product group and a bunch of other coaches from around Europe. And Joaquim was one of the people who came. And Joaquim was at Spotify back in the day. And I looked up what he said about the Spotify model. It was... Um, Enlightening. Joaquim said, even at the time we wrote it, we weren't doing it. It was part ambition and part approximation. It was a sales job to get people to try and work that way in their own company. The problem is the rest of us bought it. And he recognizes people have really struggled to copy something that didn't really exist. So how could you make the Spotify model work? if it didn't even work in the first place. Let's talk about another model that some of you have seen. How many people are in a safe house or uh, have worked in a safe place before? Yeah. I think safe is a great product. I'm not gonna make fun of it in the same way that most people will. I'm gonna make fun of it in a different way. Safe is a brilliant product if you think about who is the customer and who is the vendor. The customer for safe is a management team. The vendor for it is a consulting team, usually. SAFE is an amazing product for selling that management team on the illusion of control. It is not a great product for getting great products out the door. Doesn't mean it won't work in some places, but that's not what it's ultimately designed for. It is designed to be a management consultancy uh, value. It is brilliant at that. I can't compete with it. I really wish I could. It would be, make me much, much, much happier. One of the problems with SAFE and with lots of other things is artifacts. How many times have you been in a workshop where you spent all day putting things together and making this amazing opportunity solution tree or service map or uh, backlog and uh, prioritized backlog? You've done this, yes? When did you look at it again? Did it just go into a drawer or a wall somewhere? I mean, if you do use it continuously, that's brilliant, but it's even harder when you're working in hybrid and remote and you're using some of my favorite tools like Miro and Mural and things like that. They're wonderful. The problem is it's not in your face anymore. But the artifact was never actually the point of that workshop. The point of the workshop was the conversations the alignment, the communication, and the relationships that you had. That's invaluable. It doesn't mean that the artifact is useless. It's just not necessarily the point of what you're doing. That's the one. Thank you. <laughs> Artifacts aren't the point uh, because there's a big difference between outputs and outcomes. The point, oh God, I had the word five minutes ago and now I've lost it. Kromovka? Thank you. So the point isn't the Kromovka cookies or cakes. Having them is great. Eating them is the point. The output of baking isn't what you want. You want this happy, smiley face and the flavor. 
That's what you want from this. So the artifact isn't the point. It's can you as a team work better together after you've created that artifact? And the last problem I'm going to talk about right now is language barriers. This comes up all the time. When we go to talk to executive committees, we have a problem because we think we're really smart because we've spent a lot of time learning these frameworks and we've put things on a canvas and we've put it all together and we want to show it to other people and they don't get it. And they don't get it because they don't speak our language. And they shouldn't get it because they have a lot of things that they're concerned about that we just don't deal with day to day. The problem is that not with them, it's with us. We're not having a productive conversation because we're not speaking in their language. This is something that Kat brought up yesterday. If you saw her talk, you'll know what uh, Eats a Grape is all about. We need to communicate to people in the appropriate language. Our job when we're being advocates for our team or even within our teams is to be a translator and to make sure that everything, everyone understands and things and is working well together because of it. So I've spent the last 15, 20 minutes now talking about tools. Um, and I think I sounded reasonably coherent and smart, but here's the part where I admit that I'm actually a complete and utter idiot. And I'm an idiot because I'm now going to spend the next 15 minutes or so talking to you about a tool that I made. <laughs> and I'm going to talk to you about a tool that I made not because I want you to use it. I'd be delighted if you did. It would be great. That's not the point. I'll get to the point later. But I'll tell you why I made a tool in the first place. These are some of my favorite things to use. Uh, Teresa Torres's Opportunity Solution Tree. Um, impact mapping, it's not from Tim originally, but if you know Tim, he's brilliant and has done a lot of great writing on the subject and is my favorite place to go to learn more about impact mapping. Uh, same thing with assumptions mapping. David, I don't think originated it, but talks about it really brilliantly. And the five whys has been around forever, but mine, the product, and Miro have great content on it. And they're wonderful tools. And I am completely and utterly incompetent at using them. I can use them with myself. And I can use them with people like you who have famili some familiarity with the tools and the concepts. But when I go and do workshops and work with stakeholders, we end up spending half an hour debating the difference between an output, an outcome, and an impact. And none of that is adding value to our conversation. It's not why we're together. So I wanted something that I could start using in five minutes or less potentially not even tell them that I'm using a tool and get us talking about what actually mattered. So that's what I did. So I created something that I like to call dragon mapping. Is it going to work? There we go. Dragon mapping. So uh, if you are familiar with this picture with really old maps, uh, when people made th these maps, they didn't necessarily know what was in certain places. It hadn't been explored yet. They knew it was potentially dangerous. So they'd put dragons and whirlpools and monsters on the map. That's kind of what we do with discovery. We know what our starting point is. We know what things look like. We kind of have a picture of where we want to get to, ideally, but we don't necessarily know what's going to happen along the way. And that's really my goal when I'm talking to people. I want to create an environment for teams to succeed. So to do that, I need to make sure that we all agree where we are and where we're trying to get to and have at least a tentative plan with some acknowledgement of the challenges along the way. So let me give you an example of how this all works. It's three steps. It really couldn't be simpler. First step, list your goals. And a goal is very simple. It's something, it's like an objective and an OKR. Actually, it is an OKR. It's what are we trying to achieve, to achieve and how will we know when we've accomplished it? Make sense? Yeah, easy. Next, answer this question. For this to happen, for this goal to be achieved, what must be true? Or you can turn around and say for this to be true, what must happen? Either way works. Step three, do it again. Just keep asking that question as many times as needed. Like I said, this is an idiot's version of opportunity solution tree, impact mapping, assumptions mapping, and five whys that you can use in just a couple of minutes. So let's try it out. 
I want to grow my cookie business enough to quit my day job. Now, that's an objective, the key results I would need to, to actually list. So I'm not going to do that here, but we can say I need to make X amount of money per week to, to be able to quit my day job, and I need to do that for enough weeks in a row that I think it, find it predictable and reliable. To do that, there are three things I have to be able to do to make this true. One is people have to be able to buy my cookies. People have to like my cookies, and I have to prove that I can make money selling my cookies. And then I would ask the same question again. I'm not going to do it for all of these to just give you the, the flavor of this, but let's stick with flavor. So I need to know that people like my chocolate chip cookies or my chocolate cookies, uh, that people like my peanut co butter cookies, and I realize I'm talking about sweets at the end of a long day at a conference, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, my third one is I want to know that people like my Marmite cookies. Does anyone here know what Marmite is? Yeah. Does anyone like it? Yeah. This is the, you can see where I'm going with this. Okay. I knew there was going to be a British person here who disagreed with me about this. And that is perfect. Thank you, Carrie. So I did lie earlier. There aren't three steps. There's actually a fourth step. The fourth step is to then go back and validate these things. Ask, is this a fact or is this, is this an assumption? And this is where, thank you, research comes in. So um, let's go back and look at this. I can prove that people like my chocolate cookies because I sell out of them every day and everyone tells me how much they like them. I can do the same with my peanut butter cookies. They're going great. Sorry, Kerry, you're the only one who's buying my Marmite cookies and it's just not enough. You can have them. So that's not sustainable. I need to sell more than two types of cookies to make this work. So let's try something else. Turns out, let's try Kromovka. And it turns out people do like my Kromovka. It's wonderful. So now I have proven this leg of my tripod here, that people like my cookies. I still have to prove that people can buy them. Can they buy them from me directly in a store? Can they buy them online? Can, uh, do I sell them through other shops? I'd have to ask all those questions. I'd have to ask questions about, can I make money selling cookies? Um, what is the markup? What is my cost of resource, cost of labor, all of those things. But if I can prove all those things, I've got a plan. But I can also prioritize against this. And the fundamental difference here is it's not me and a stakeholder arguing about which of these things are true or what we must do. We're not talking to each other. We're talking to an artificial thing, to an artifact that's in between us. And we're just saying, can we actually prove this? Can you bring the proof to it? Now there's no ego in it. It's not about me telling you that you're wrong or that we need to do something different. It's us saying, how do we pr know this? How do we do this together? And that's a really key difference. It's a fundamental change in the character of the conversation. And this is what Squirrel was talking about yesterday. People working with good processes on the right prioritization and having a similar perception of things. If you can pull that all together, then you're going to make great products. So you can learn more about dragon mapping. Again, you'll have all the slides at the end. You can do this. There's a template on Miro. There's a temple on Mural. But I don't care if you use this. I'd love it if you did. I'd love it if you told me stories about uh, how it was useful for you. But that's not the point. The point is that I'm an idiot, and I made a tool. And I made a tool because it works for me, and it's easy for me. If you can do the same thing, you can adapt this tool. You can adapt any other tool. Do you know how many different canvases there are out there now? There's hundreds, if not thousands, of different canvases that people use that you can Google, and it's amazing. But all those started from a very, very simple canvas, and then everyone adapted it as needed. And that's fine. It's great. Use the tool that you need when it's useful, and if it doesn't work for you, make it different. Make it work for you. So this is the end part of this. It's scary. Saying that you need to take responsibility and it's not as simple as just taking what other people have done before, but you doing it yourself, it's, it's tough. 
It's tough because it's hard enough doing this job alone and having these conversations with yourself. It's hard to admit vulnerability and admit that you're wrong about things or you're unsure about stuff. It does get easier if you have a partner. And it does get better when you work together on things. And the fundamental difference that I find in using tools is what you're trying to change is moving from the concept of, I can't. Anytime you find yourself saying, I can't do this, it's not working. You wanna change that attitude to moving towards, we can. If we can do things, we have lots of people together, what is it that we can all accomplish? But this is a little bit scary. So let's talk about what we've learned from all this or what I hope you've taken away from this. So we've learned that all tools are terrible, except, there we go, except when they're useful because this is the way the world works. It's not strict. It's not definitive. Things work except when they don't, or don't work except when they do. And let's ex just accept that. We use the tools to have better conversations. Those conversations can be with ourselves or with other people. And we adapt those tools as needed. We make them work for us. And if there's not one out there that you're finding that's working, try another and keep trying. And if that doesn't work, you can make your own. There's nobody stopping you. There is no guild of product tool makers. There is, you don't need a certification to do this. It is finding something that works for you. It is the difference between accepting dogma and saying, this is the way we've always done it or going to, 20, it was, I think Squirrel said, page 27 in the Scrum Guide. That is not important. What's important is figuring out when do you use a tool, what is it good for, why is it working, why is it not working, and what can I do with it? There's something really weird about this slide, and at some point it will actually move forward. And if it doesn't do it this way, let's see. There we go. Finally, so thank you all very much. You can get all the slides. I promised you there was a link, a very simple link. You can get all the slides there. Um, you can stay in contact with me. Out of Owls is my site. Uh, you can listen to the Product Experience podcast. I'd love it if you did. We come out every Wednesday. Lily and I talk to really brilliant people. Uh, we've had a, a squirrel and Mark who talked yesterday. I've already been guests on the podcast. There are people here I will be chasing up to talk on the podcast in the future. Um, if you're interested in coming to a virtual Lean Coffee for product-minded people, you can join us at Product in the Ether. And I've just launched a community for chief product officers. So if you are one, please come talk to me. And if you think your boss uh, could use some uh, company of other chief product officers and upskill themselves, please tell them to come talk to me as well. Thank you all very much. If you want to have uh, any questions, I don't think I can, I can so. run for yeah. two questions. Yes, please. I did today 18,000 steps. I can do 20. Yeah. Any questions? And someone was just uh, doing their hairs. <laughs> no? No, it's the end of a it's very long end. conference. Yeah, yeah. Okay. A warm applause for Randy then.